I am Valentin Fuster from New York, and we are in the beautiful city of Stockholm, where we have the European Society of Cardiology meeting uh, with a tremendous attendance and an excellent panel today to discuss some of the breakthroughs trials being presented in the meeting. So before I go any further, let me introduce the panelists. Uh, in my left, Dr. Cecilia Lindt, the Chief of Cardiology at the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm. Again, very sophisticated city, wonderful. Dr. Harvey White, uh, known by many of you by being in this show before, Director of the Coronary Care and Cardiovascular Research at the Auckland City Hospital in New Zealand. And Dr. Clyde uh, Yancey, past president, immediate past president of the American Heart Association and medical director at Baylor Heart and Vascular Institute in Dallas. And then we go to my right, uh, Dr. Franz Serli, director of the hypertension program at Columbia University College of Physicians in New York. Dr. Cornelia Kotseva, Senior Clinical Research Fellow and Consultant Cardiologist at the Imperial College in London. She is really a, a real, is an expert on prevention. So you prevent us if we go out to the margins today. And then we have Dr. Keith Fox, also well known here by, no. by the audience, President of the British Cardiovascular Society and Sciences and Head of Medical and radiological consultant at cardiologist uh, and cardiologist at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, very well known to all of you by his sparking comments and by his excitement. He tells me he's British, but I would say he's a Spaniard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I'm a Zimbabwean. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go into the uh, discussion today, and it's interesting. We are going to be talking about three different topics, all extremely important. The first one will be atrial fibrillation. The second one will be in cardiac failure. And the third one is going to be about coronary artery disease. And, and basically, the themes are going to be related to pharmacology. And interesting things happen in this meeting uh, that will uh, evolve during our discussion. Uh, we decided to begin with a trial that was just presented four hours ago, and perhaps is one of the most exciting uh, trials presented here, which is, uh, the name is uh, Averros, Apixaban versus Acetyl Salicylic Acid to prevent strokes. Before we discuss this trial, um, I I'd like to give a background. Two of the most interesting drugs evolving in the antithrombotic field are oral, oral antithrombins and 10A inhibitors that can be given orally, of course. And what has evolved over the last three to five years about these two types of agents is oral antithrombins block thrombin as it has been generated, but there's always some thrombin around which may prevent bleeding. On the other hand, the oral 10A inhibitors, they prevent the synthesis of thrombin, and if the dose is significant, there's no thrombin around, and it has been a question about the possibility of bleeding with these drugs. This is interesting because this is the background of the trial that we are going to be discussing today, and uh, this was presented, the Averroes trial was presented by Dr. Stuart Connolly at McMaster's University in Hamilton, Ontario. And basically, uh, it's about 522 patients that began to enter into this trial in 2007. These are patients with atrial fibrillation, involved 36 countries, and they were unsuitable or intolerant to the use of warfarin. So in this trial, uh, the patients were randomized into five milligrams of a Pixaban twice a day, and aspirin 81 to 325 milligrams uh, that were given daily 
both drugs up to uh, 36 months or until the end of the study. Now, the results uh, have been quite striking. The treatment with apixaban significantly reduced the risk of a stroke or systemic embolic events, primary endpoints, by 54%. And interestingly, the overall risk of bleeding was increased in the drug as expected, but did not reach a statistical significance, which is quite important. It was an increase of about 14%. Just specifically, uh, a stroke or systemic emboli, the rate over this period of time of 36 months was 3.6% in the aspirin group and 1.8% in the apixaban uh, group, uh, with a relative risk of 0.46, the odds ratio. Very, very, very significant. And then if we go into the bleeding aspects, measure bleeding, 1.2% in aspirin, 1.4% in apixaban, and clinical relevant non mesh bleeding, 2.6 aspirin, 3% apixaban, and minor bleeding, 4.1% aspirin, 5.2% apixaban. The fact of the matter is uh, this is very striking because one might expect more bleeding, and I think it has been a very smart approach with this drug. I have seen over the last five years the dose being decreased progressively into the dose that has been discussed today, which is probably close to perfect. This is the study. And uh, Keith, I'm going to ask you first, are you surprised? Uh, you, in fact, no. Good. Because if you look at the, uh, the trials that have used an agent against aspirin, the meta-analysis has shown, on average, about a 35% risk reduction. Now, this is a bigger effect in this study, but they're confidence intervals, and those confidence intervals are within the boundaries of the 35% seen elsewhere. But actually, what really impresses me about this is that um, we've got the population with atrial fibrillation who are poorly treated, undertreated, and um, here's a study that has deliberately targeted those that either are definitely unsuitable or believe that they will be unsuitable. Now, the, the investigators didn't test this against what may be regarded as one of the references in this population, which was the combination of aspirin and clopidogrel mm -hmm. in the Active A study, which showed benefit over aspirin alone. Yeah, we'll talk in a moment. Harvey. You have been in this business for a long time, mm -hmm. and I'd like to uh, your opinion about it. Uh, are you impressed about it? Uh, Keith already knew the results before they appear. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? I'm ambivalent. I'm always unimpressed if there's less than 500 events. This is a small trial that was stopped early, and I don't think we have enough information about the bleeding. 14% increased. We're talking about you know 20 events versus something. Uh, I have no confidence around that. But having said that, it is impressive uh, that uh, stroke embolism is reduced. I have questions about the study. 27% uh, had CHAD score above three. You've got to be on warfarin for those patients. And I have great uncertainty as to why these patients couldn't uh, uh, take warfarin. So in, in a way I think the trial appears to me to be stacked. Uh, didn't go to a large enough number to look at the bleeding. I don't know why they stopped it early. It's not like it's going to be taken up into clinical practice and patients are going to be deprived of uh, a uh, uh, treatment benefit. Uh, I'm also concerned about a drug where you take it twice a day uh, and the where if you miss a dose, uh, what happens, that's real world. And uh, so we have to translate this into our patients who may be elderly, et cetera, and they may be having falls. Uh, this drug, which theoretically would increase bleeding. So I think impressive, uh, but not convincing. It's interesting your comment, Clyde. I want to ask you uh, about termination of trials. This is not a trial in which warfarin was used. Comparing with a Pixaban, where I understand 
if a pixel band was very superior, they could uh, stop the trial because the gold standard is warfaring. But what do you think of uh, stopping a trial uh, of this magnitude in which it's not clear the type of patients who enter into the trial and didn't give the chance to really look at bleeding, which is an issue for a longer period of time? I think that is an important consideration. We've learned that um, in any number of circumstances now, where trials have been prematurely discontinued, even with appropriate stopping boundaries and going beyond those boundaries and feeling ethically persuaded to discontinue the trial, as Harvey points out, we just don't have sufficient numbers of events to be really confident in the statistical analyses. And some of those early analyses can appear much more robust than the effect actually is. But remember that the comparator here is aspirin. It was a non-statistically <laughs> significant increase compared to aspirin. And so we're looking at something that is widely regarded as a reasonably safe option, particularly for higher risk patients. And I have the same sense of concern that Harvey expressed. Nearly a third clearly had an indication for anticoagulation with warfarin sodium, and instead were being treated with aspirin. So I would really like to understand who those patients were, and I would be willing to accept some exposure to bleeding if it's no worse than aspirin, if we can manage the stroke risk for those patients. There's one other thing that tempers our enthusiasm. When we look at the number of patients needed to treat to reduce events, it's measured per 1,000 patients. So you'd have to treat 1,000 patients yeah. to reduce 18 events. So even though the 54% reduction is persuasive, it's still a fairly modest effect. This leads to the question, Franz, and uh, into what is next. It reminds me of the tennis games. Let me, let me tell you about the semifinals. <laughs> you have the Vigatran, an oral antithrombin that was used against warfarin. Mm -hmm. And the results were very significant in terms of the bleeding aspect in particular. Now we have a Pixaban. You think the next stage is to compare to warfarin? We call this a semifinal, two semifinals. One, we already know the data. Well, there are put two, two points here. Um, warfarin remains the gold standard for the time being. Uh, and of course, ultimately, both of these drugs will have to be compared against warfarin. I think that is mandatory. But on the other hand, as Keith has said, there are a substantial number of patients who cannot tolerate or cannot take warfarin. Yeah. Physicians are unwilling to prescribe warfarin. And in such patients, obviously, a Pixaban is uh, a decent choice. I think that's, that's important. Yeah. The trial that I'm referring to is the Aristotle tri trial, which I think is ongoing already, mm -hmm. which is comparing a Pixaban with warfarin. And at least we will see how uh, this turns out. And then, if it works, will be a final, isn't it? <laughs> yep. A Pixaban <laughs> versus well, the Viga trial. Right. Yes. Uh, the question I have is, should we explore more these kind of patients who are not tolerant to warfarin? Uh, and may, may look at, and maybe looking at the combination of clopidogrel and aspirin versus a Vigatran. I'm just trying to figure out what is the next step in this regard. I personally don't think antiplatelets are the route to go down because in terms of the mechanism that we have here, we have such clear evidence for treatment effect, now for anti-10As, for warfarin, that I think the, you know, the aspirin, clopidogrel was an attempt while we had nothing else. But I don't think it's the end game. Okay. You, you are an expert on atrial fibrillation. Yes, well, my reflection is, is it the doctor who is reluctant to prescribe warfarin or is it the patient? You don't get a clear definition of why the patient is unwilling to comply. I think in, in this country we've made a lot of effort into actually having good uh, warfarin clinics and we've been fairly successful mm -hmm. in achieving our treatment goals. And uh, I'm afraid that if you let the patient use uh, any of these antithrombotic agents, they might think it's just a drug like anything else and skip a dose here and there, or maybe take too many, and you will not have an uh, um, assessment of the compliance and what goal is reached. Moreover, I'm afraid of interaction with other drugs. 
uh, that has not uh, been elucidated as far as I know. Um, moreover, I also think that maybe not only one third, but two thirds of, of uh, uh, the avarosis uh, patients were actually indicated for warfarin according to the present European guidelines, and uh, that the comparison in the Aristotle uh, trial is more relevant, perhaps, and, and a logic next step. Yeah, it's a very rational uh, comment. What you make is that we have to be very careful here, not jumping without exploring to the very end, and, and, uh, and, and certainly in the north of Europe, and, uh, you have been really uh, very, very successful in running the Kumadin clinics. I don't think we have been like this in the United States, but uh, probably many of the patients you are, you are suggesting that are in this trial, you might have been able to carry through. I Kumadin. believe with a proper motivation, and then they also feel that this is a serious treatment that you cannot just treat like any other drug. You really have to comply at least if we go on perhaps beyond the indication of atrial fibrillation to other more severe conditions such as mechanical uh, heart valves, for example, which would probably uh, sure. uh, be a development in the future. Cornelia, you, you are in the area of prevention and economics. Now, we all talk about the future, oral antithrombins, apixaban. I don't know what the cost is going to be. So my, my, the comment that I, uh, I like, or at least the question I have to you, should we be thinking more openly that we have to be very careful because there is a cost in all these drugs which is not really being taken into account. We are not against the trials, but at least it's important to have a comment about it. Warfarin is very cheap. Yeah, this is the main advantage of warfarin, that it's very cheap. And uh, uh, as in every trial with every drug, we need a cost-effectiveness analysis. So. Uh, and if we don't know whether it's cost effective, we, uh, we can't recommend it now. But we, this takes lots of time to, um, to do this kind of cost of effective analysis. I was part of a committee on global health with a document of the Institute of Medicine, and <laughs> there were 15 people, and uh, there were a number of economists there. And one of the things that came out is that the future of trials is going to be cost effectiveness. We will not be talking about drug A versus drug B anymore. We will be talking about uh, a formula, whatever the formula is in which the cost will enter. I think this is a new era coming, and, and these things make you think about it. Keith, you have a yeah, comment. But, but you know, it's not just drug A versus drug B. We're all familiar with the cost of stroke which is devastating. Yeah. And the trouble is our healthcare systems are not geared up to move the budgets from long-term treatment of strokes into um, acute treatment and drug therapy. Mm -hmm. And we need to be more sophisticated to be able to do that. Yeah. And there are two other costs involved. One is a cost by removal, if you will, because there is a finite cost to having clinics that manage anticoagulation. And if you're in a circumstance where the need is less for that, then how does that get factored into the equation? We haven't had to do that kind of analysis before when we do cost effectiveness. But the other cost that I think uh, really needs to be considered carefully is that I don't know that we've had enough dwell time with these newest agents to recognize whether or not there are any off-target or unforeseen consequences of being exposed to those drugs. That could be a very real cost that we must yeah. be very thoughtful about. So yes. one of the reassuring Hardly. things here was that there was no effect on liver functions. And I think that has been a recurring theme with antithrombotic, oral antithrombotic agents. So that's another sort of that's positive it thing. Appears but small numbers of patients, yeah. as we pointed out. Yeah. yeah, that's far it does not appear to be the case. Well, the issue of cost is always important to bring this into discussion, but we, we have to move scientifically and one may say maybe we should move scientifically first and then we will talk about cost afterwards but we cannot disregard the issue when this is an epidemic that uh, cardiovascular disease in general that is evolving all over the world and one of the issues is cost and that is can we prevent it rather than treating it if we have to treat it we need to have drugs that are uh, are feasible and, and appropriate uh, economically to the country well, I, uh, I would like to summarize uh, this particular study, Averroes' study, with this new uh, 10A inhibitor, Apixaban, uh, by saying it's a good appetizer. It's a good appetizer for uh, atrial fibrillation. 
it gives, it opens the door into a type of drugs that have been concerns about bleeding, uh, I would say, the 10A inhibitors, the oral. And certainly there is a very uh, tricky road in front of these drugs, uh, but at least it's something that now we can begin to think uh, perhaps in a much more optimistic way than it was before. We discuss here the pros and cons, uh, the interesting uh, numbers that came out from a study of a relatively small number of people. We have questions about who entered into the study. But overall, I think it's a good, um, it's a good message uh, that NA inhibitors are here for some time. And let's see how they compare with the oral antithrombins in the future. So let's now move into um, a second topic. Actually, this topic is, <laughs> I think, is quite exciting. I never thought that heart rate was so important. <laughs> but <let's laughs> we all know it's important, but not to the extent <laughs> of what we are going to be discussing right now. Uh, again, as, a, as, a, uh, as a, an introduction to the subject, we all read in the literature uh, that uh, heart rate has some implication in terms of events, uh, particularly uh, fast heart rate and the heart rate variability has been discussed many, many times. I always thought that beta blockers, actually part of the good of beta blockers was heart rate dependent. In other words, when we put somebody on angina, on a beta blocker, and you put it on the treadmill, rather than rate 150, it goes into 100, and the patient can, goes fur can go further. In cardiac failure, despite of all the systolic function and all of that, was also a heart rate aspect. So. Uh, this is the, the background, so I became very interested to read that there is something that has lost the heart rate that is a miracle. Well, let's go into this. This is the study called SHIFT, S-H-I-F, Systolic Heart Failure Treatment with the EVE inhibitor. This is a pacemaker current uh, related to the uh, uh, sodium-potassium channel, which is very predominant in the sinus node. And, and the drug that we are talking today is Ivavadrin, um, which is a, a very interesting drug, as I mentioned, that is um, very much, uh, at least what is known, is affects the pacemaker rate, particularly of the sinus node, through this um, sodium-potassium channel. Well, this is a very interesting study uh, that uh, was presented uh, a couple of days ago here in, in Stockholm. Uh, by Dr. Michel uh, Comegda, who is the upcoming president of the European Society of Cardiology. And the paper just came out in The Lancet, and the first author is Dr. Carl Swedberg, who is the, uh, from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Well, this is a study uh, uh, on patients with cardiac failure. Cardiac failure that were symptomatic, at least the patients were class two. Some of them were actually class four. The study is an international study uh, in 37 countries, and the number of patients that entered was over 6,000. Now, these patients had an ejection fraction of less than 35%. A resting heart rate was more than 70 beats per minute. And the patient had been hospitalized for at least uh, within a year prior to entering into the trial. And these patients were randomized into ibavradrin at the starting dose of five milligrams twice a day, it could go into a maximum of 7.5, trying to reach a heart rate of 50 to 60 beats per minute. And the other half of the patients, of course, uh, were on placebo. I would say that the heart rate, uh, the average heart rate decrease with the drug was about 15 beats per minute. And we will discuss this more in a minute. Now, uh, the results were very significant. There was an 18% reduction in the odds ratio for cardiovascular death or hospitalization for worsening heart failure in the group treated with Ivardin. In fact, there were 29% of the patients who had these two endpoints, one of the two endpoints, in the placebo group, and 24% in the Ivardin group, with an odds ratio of 0.82 and a significant p-value. And then when uh, independently uh, 
they look at the uh, deaths from heart failure and hospitalization for heart failure. Both were significant, but particularly hospitalization for heart failure was significantly decreased from 21% to 16% uh, in this particular group. Now, uh, the study is quite fascinating, and we will be discussing a number of issues. Uh, first, we will discuss the use of beta blockers in the study, since we are dealing with heart rate. Then we will discuss, is heart rate really the reason for this benefit? And it seems this is the case, and we also will discuss this aspect. But before we go into the details, um, let me ask you, uh, what do you think about the study in itself? These are patients with cardiac failure, and you are just dealing with the heart rate, and it seems you are going to do much better. Well, one point I'd like to make, and I'll come back to what you just said about cost. I mean, obviously, hospitalization for heart failure was drastically diminished, and that is a cost issue. So there's little doubt that here we have a cost-efficient drug. Now, Otto Hess, the group of Otto Hess a few years ago, did uh, summarize heart rate and heart failure, and they showed in about 15 trials that heart rate is a major determinant of outcome in heart failure. So this is not so surprising to me, actually. So Val, if you will allow, yes, there's another perspective here that we should begin with. This is a positive heart failure trial. It's been a while. It has. Yeah. And we have another opportunity to treat patients perhaps with a strategy that moves a meaningful endpoint. The next thing is that it's a proof of concept trial, or almost a proof of concept trial. Certainly it implicates heart rate and it changes our understanding of the disease process. We were so convinced that neurohormonal activation was fundamentally the most important thing, yet an approach independent of neurohormonal activation, likely independent of reverse remodeling, appears to have influenced the natural history. It's important that we vet this new information and understand how else we might exploit it but I want to go back to the very first statement. We have a positive trial in heart failure. We really have needed this. Yeah, uh, actually it's fascinating, Cecilia. You are used to heart rates, beta blockers, and all of that. Are you impressed by this particular study? Yes, I am impressed. I only have the reflection that in spite of that, uh, many patients were actually in function class two, that not a higher a compliance with uh, the, the target dose of beta blockers could be achieved. In fact, 50% achieved the 50% of the recommended dose. Um, and that's something that could be discussed. Why was this so? And then uh, if Eva Bradin was able to lower heart rate by on the average 15 beats per minute, to which extent was that due to maybe uh, there was a more lowering of the beta blockers or and, and in favor of this Eva Bradin during the study that I haven't looked at. but. Could there have been changes in the baseline medication uh, during uh, the duration of the study which uh, could have influenced the results? That's one of my questions. Um, so it's a good issue uh, to discuss, Keith, because the, the question I have really is on beta blockers here. Uh, we know beta blockers are not so simple as people think. You give a beta blocker and you get diet fatigue and so forth. So it's not. We cannot say everybody should be on beta blockers and go home and close the books. Yeah. <laughs> the reality is not this. But when you look at this study, I wonder if beta blockers were tolerated, you wouldn't achieve the same thing. I'm just asking. Or maybe to ask the question the other way around, how much of the heart rate effect of beta blocker is responsible for the uh, change in outcome that we've seen? You know, we've not been able to dissect that. And I agree with Clyde, you know, here's, Here's a study that is going to change practice after, after this Congress. And I think it's one of the ones that people are going to remember after this Congress because um, we know that there's a relationship with heart rate. There's a separate paper linked to this, which was also presented um, earlier on in, in the meeting and showed that the biggest treatment effect was on those with the highest heart rate. So it's not just the relationship, the adverse relationship with heart rate and outcome, but the best treatment effect. And we should emphasize, this is an agent that has no impact in terms of its inotropic response. 
So we, for, what, for the first time, we're dissecting just the chronotropic uh, response from everything else. So I find it quite exciting. Harvey? I think it's very exciting. Uh, my one concern is that baseline line, uh, therapy was not optimal. And I think when we do clinical trials, we must have optimal uh, therapy as our background. And we strive to do that. We even have scorecards feeding back uh, to the sites now. 11% of patients were not on beta blockers. Only 50%, as you me uh, mentioned, uh, got target heart rate beta blocker dose. And then a number of beta blockers, which I think is a very important uh, point, are not evidence-based. So the beta blockers, other than metoprolol and covetolol. So there is a question about background therapy, optimal treatment. Uh, but I must say I'm very impressed as well, and it will change practice. You've ever been uh, tried. Uh, it seems it's a drug that was well, very well tolerated. Uh, obviously, there is not a good comparison because on trials you don't say Inderal or, or Metoprol cause fatigue. Right. But it seems at least uh, the people were very well attuned to the drug. Is not correct? That's correct. The only signal of a side effect or an adverse effect that emerged was expected bradycardia, and it happened in a very small <laughs> percentage point admittedly statistically significantly so, but everything else was really a wash. So it seemed, no drug is innocuous, but it seemed as if it could be added relatively easily. Now it is adding to the problem of polypharmacy that we already have in heart failure, and an important proviso that needs to be said immediately is that this does not obviate the need for beta blocker. No one should think that the beta blocker can be discontinued because of fatigue or confusion in place of the new compound. That's not the scenario. But it may allow us to use a lower dose of the beta blocker, right? And that's very important. Well, this is a very interesting discussion because we talk about the dose of beta blockers as if it's a precise number. And we recognize that when we go back to the heart failure trials, the greatest survival advantage was really at the first one or two incremental steps in the dosing of the beta blocker. And the evidence to say that it really was a linear dose response is quite specious. So we ought to accept the fact that perhaps being on the beta blocker is what's most important, that is worrying about the 15% on nothing, and then adopting other strategies. I could go on and on about heart failure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, you can go on and on, but there's a <laughs> question that I'd like you to answer. Uh, the beta blocker has a second effect, which is the, the original that was used for the cardiac failure, which is the, the function of the myocardium. Is not correct? So be correct. sure we don't get away from it. Be sure we don't get away from it, and be sure that we still respect the neurohormonal hypothesis. Yeah. It really is sound. Yeah. But are you so can sure? I ask a different <laughs> question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's, you. you know, we, we have a lot of drugs in heart failure. How do we know that, you know, as we improve the scenarios and add in more agents, how do we know whether we need all of them? You know, Harvey's talked about we've got to have the background of standard of care, and I agree with you. But what we don't know, that having raised the bar, whether we need all of them uh, in order and have a simplified regime for our patients. But we're not going to replace other therapies with this drug. There's no effect on mortality. No, I'm, I'm, asking, so I'm asking a more general principle that, that you know, we're adding yeah. in a whole series yeah. of drugs. So I think the question you raise is the one that is very provocative that needs to be addressed. Because we've not ever thought about doing studies that involve subtraction. Mm. Because yeah. we now have something that's superior. Mm. But it also raises a tangential issue that's almost equally as important. We have to begin to accept that not every patient responds to a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor or an ARB mm. in the same way. Imagine if we knew by some marker, perhaps a, a genetic profile, that a person was minimally responsive to the mm -hmm. beta blocker. Mm -hmm. Here is an alternative approach that right. might allow you to go in a different pathway yep. Yep. and still do reasonable. Now this is something that is very much theoretical and I wouldn't advocate going out and doing it now, mm -hmm. but we ought to begin to take a deep breath and say, can we revisit some of the standards mm -hmm. and put those standards in sure. a context? Sure. One question, uh, Harvey, you mentioned mortality. I think it's important, 5% uh, to 3%. Uh, I'm amazed about the, low, amazed. the low mortality mm. in this study, which points out into maybe there are many class two patients uh, uh, because it's, it's just hard to believe patients in cardiac failure with this, this so 
low mortality. But if I can just come with the device, try to say I'm a CRT person, and this looks exactly the same as he made it CRT and the reverse trial with an the same amount of follow-up time. So this is probably how a well-treated function class 2 patient looks like. And it also gets us back to this mm -hmm. issue of dose. How important is the dose? Because we do have a heart failure population exposed to evidence-based therapies that are really responding vis-a-vis -vis their outcomes as one would anticipate. Yes, they could have been on higher doses, but could they have tolerated higher doses? It may be that when we talk about optimal therapy, what we might say instead is ordinary therapy to reflect what's really happening in the community and then see if this strategy gives us some advantages. Very provocative stuff, lots of questions here. Uh, Maybe uh, I'd like to, to, to finish by talking about heart rate. And you mentioned a paper that was presented by Dr. Michael Wong, which actually is also in The Lancet. Yes. It just came out. I think it's fascinating. What basically says is this a straight relationship between heart rate and events in the trial. And actually, it says for every heartbeat, can we check your heartbeats because we, can, we <laughs> might be able to prevent, to, to put every heartbeat 3% increase. <laughs> in the, uh, but it's a fascinating uh, line, mm. so it seems to me that heart rate is important here. Heart uh, rate is important. You know, I mean, uh, it's been observed all the way along, but we didn't know, at, it, this chicken and egg situation, we didn't know that it was just a function, a surrogate for the extent of myocardial damage. Well, it even goes beyond that because you already have a compromised mm. myocardial substrate with impaired energetics. Sure. And what is one of the most important predictors of myocardial O2 consumption but heart rate? Mm. So you take an impaired heart muscle subjected to a higher heart rate, mm. is that not accelerating the injury course? Sure. Sure. Yeah. But there's one other thing that's very important, Val, I cannot let you go on without us getting to this. And Cecilia, you brought the point up. The use of device therapy in this trial We're going was to talk incredibly about. low. All right. Uh, allow me to make <laughs> one more point. You <laughs> said, no, you said, Clyde, that this is a shift of the paradigm Maybe. away from the neurohumoral theory or of the treatment of hypertension. It, are you really sure that ivaglutin has no neurohumoral effect? Well, these channels mm -hmm. that are being modified, otherwise known as funny channels, may have some additional effects that we haven't fully explored. So I think we have to continue to hold court on the full breadth of the mechanism here. And Keith, you've been involved in the development of this compound. Maybe you have an in some insight there. Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, th that was only uh, at the very early stage. But I, I agree with you. I, I think we need to know much more about it. We need to know um, what we have now is interesting. I think it's provocative. And it may well change some of our approaches. Yeah. Well, um, uh, it's interesting, certainly is a fascinating study and, uh, and really points out the importance of heart rate. Uh, the device uh, use was very, very low, but I wonder when we put pacemakers on these people, what heart rate we should use? Because particularly, you know, this is an interesting issue. Now we have to start thinking again, mm -hmm. how many patients we see that they're pacing at 70, 75, 80 per minute, and they don't feel so well when they're in cardiac failure. Maybe that's the issue. Well, the one thing here, in addition to that, is that because patients had to be in sinus rhythm, it could have been that that obviated some of the patients that would have been on CRT because yeah. that would have been more awkward. But what really gets me is that these are patients with low EF heart failure, 3 to 4% penetration of ICDs. Even with the recent release ESC device guidelines that came out just this week, there is a very high imperative to deploy ICDs as indicated for patients yeah. who are at risk. So, I mean, we, curiosity, yeah. we really have to think carefully about what is the use of the device in the community that was tested, and might outcomes have been even better had the devices because been Because they're exposed? all symptomatic and they have the ejection mm -hmm. fraction. Which or can you take the approach in contradistinction and say, wow, in the setting of all of this therapy, is there still an advantage for the device? Now that's a very provocative course, question. See, that was behind my question earlier on. Because you know, if we're talking about event rates of three to five percent, you prove to me that this is going to be a good use of our resources. Right. Cornelia, can I ask you a question by watching all of these? You you really prevent disease and rather than do you think we are crazy? <laughs> you giving so many drugs. <laughs> we are talking about four or five drugs here. And yes. you would say why we didn't prevent this? Why? Uh, 
I think the question with uh, adherence with medication is very important in all patients, and especially patients with heart failure, because they are put on so many different drugs. Uh, but the advantage of uh, uh, this new drug, I think, is because it's very well tolerated and it, uh, it will not add to the side effects of uh, beta blockers or uh, ACE inhibitors or all other drugs. So I don't think you are crazy. Well, then <laughs> we can summarize uh, uh, all these comments. Um, there was, um, let me just see, yeah. We can summarize all these comments by saying that we are in disagreement with an editorial written saying no paradigm shift. This editorial was she written. Says no paradigm shift yet. yet. <laughs> uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> Thanks for you. Uh, because of the beta blocker situation, it was, uh, uh, this was uh, Dr. Terling, who is the one who, uh, who wrote such a editorial. Well, uh, certainly uh, fascinating, the heart rate story. I think this is uh, very interesting and the people is going to talk about and I think this drug appears to have a good future and certainly the concept of the heart rate. <coughs> now we are going to move into a third field that um, I think is important to discuss it because there's a lot of background and this uh, study really makes you to think. And this is about uh, the omega-3 um, unsaturated fatty acids, um, uh, fish oils. Um, and I, I like to give a little bit of background about this. Um, if you really go to the literature and you try to figure out what these supplements do, uh, you come up with uh, so many possibilities, uh, plaque stabilization, antithrombosis, antiarrhythmics because the fatty acids get into the membrane of the myocardium and there is no re-entry. All sorts of things, you can read all the mechanisms. It's like a drug that does everything right, these supplements. Well, um, in fact, if you go to the literature and you, and you study a number of trials, certainly three or four of them, you realize that the drugs can be meaningful, actually, uh, particularly in myocardial infarction. And this led to guidelines by the American Heart and the American College, for example, that you should take such supplements at least for a year if you have an acute myocardial infarction and if you have coronary disease better you eat fish at least two or three times a week. I mean, this actually came into the guidelines. With all this background and all these wonders, let's see what happened. How strong is that evidence base? Uh, we'll <laughs> discuss this in a moment. <laughs> 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 but I think it's, it, it, it's important, this discussion, yeah. because it brings many points that are really conceptual in the way we think today. And this is why I thought was, was, was pertinent to bring this up. Let's, let's now discuss the study. Um, th this is a study uh, the by the so-called Alpha Omega Group uh, done in the Netherlands, and the study was uh, actually presented by Dr. Kromhout, uh, who uh, actually also has the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine this week. And I will describe uh, um, what the study was about. Basically, these were uh, over four, uh, practically 5,000 patients in the Netherlands uh, who um, underwent four different arms in terms of treatment. And these patients, interestingly, um, had a myocardial infarction by an average of about three to four years before. So it was not an acute myocardial infarction. The patients were actually, in terms of age, um, 60 to 80 years, uh, and 78% uh, were men. What is interesting, before I describe the different arms, is uh, I have never seen a uh, so successful treatment rate right. that in this study, none. In, in fact, 86 to 98% of patients took the right antihypertensive, the right antithrombotic, the right lipid modifying drug. <laughs> I've never seen this before. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> I think this is very important. This is critical to understand yeah. the study. So basically, these people uh, were randomized into um, actually the um, 
the EPA, who is an uh, eco pensatory guide, sit there in the, uh, the, the, the how you you verbalize these names, you know, it's very difficult. The EPA, the DHA, and then these are both uh, fish oils, and then there is ALA, which is, comes from a plant. And what they did, they, they did four arms in which they used them independently, they used them in combination, they compared this to placebo. These are supplements to margarines that were given to the four groups, also the placebo group. So you have all sorts of combinations. And then these individuals uh, were followed, I, I think it was uh, probably for uh, over two years. I, I will say this in a moment uh, if I have here. But what is interesting is that the results were absolutely negative. That is, they look at uh, non-fatal uh, cardiovascular events and cardiac interventions, and there was not a hint of superiority of any of these treatments except when you look at a group of females and then at a group of diabetics, uh, which we will be discussing in a moment. This is a blow. Is a blow to many things. Uh, and obviously, to guidelines to start with, which can change, and we are all in agreement. But uh, but certainly, uh, it makes you think. <laughs> it makes you think uh, what went wrong here or what went right. And you kids, you're always uh, ready to... I don't think it's a blow at all. I, I, th I think this is, this is great, because we know that if it's you're very... blow. We know that if, <laughs> if you're really well treated, there's no advantage in adding this in. Yeah, I think it's an affirmation of evidence-based therapy. Attain at a level that not just impressed, but literally blew us all away. And so now you're trying to find some incremental benefit of adjunctive therapy over maybe the best treated patient population you've yet seen. I think it's an affirmation of evidence-based therapy. This and is why I wanted to bring up this study, is because this is a clear example of something we discussed before. Is this, we keep adding drugs or we use what we have appropriately, and this is a critical issue, Harvey. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, the GISI trial, which was positive, the use of statins was only 5%, so I think the background therapy uh, it does. Was acute myocardial infarction. Yeah, uh, within three months. So it doesn't necessarily change the, the paradigm. That was three months to a year. This is 3.6 years after infarction. So it's hard to uh, put the, the two together. And my other thought is, uh, despite our therapy, this, there's an unmet need. So you reduce something by 20% with the statin, you've still got an 80% unmet need, and, and so it goes on. And uh, our event rates are unacceptable, be they 3 or 5%, uh, any event is unacceptable to me. And if you take something that's got no side effects and is not a drug, uh, and it's found in fish and so forth, I think the, the perception is different. So I think this is a blow, um, but I don't think it changes the advice in the first year after myocardial infarction. So a non-pharmacological approach. What you are saying I think is important. <coughs> First of all, uh, this is not acute myocardial infarction, which is where the guidelines really focus on based on the Italian study. Mm -hmm. Second, is interesting, in all the studies that I reviewed, uh, there were positive. The dose given was two to three okay. times the dose given here. So. These are issues that we cannot actually dismiss. In terms of where positive females actually predominate on a number of them, here is a predominance of males. What I'm trying to play is a, a little bit the devil's advocate here sure. in saying this doesn't work the way we thought, but maybe reasons by which this is the case. Uh, what is uh, your opinion, Cecilia? <laughs> well, uh, as always, femi we women are underrepresented, and I really don't know what the excuse is for that in this particular study. Uh, but uh, bearing that in mind, I, I, the, the probably underpowered to, to detect a definite difference in women. And uh, what on the other side of the coin is that women perhaps uh, are very much more focused on their lifestyle than men. And it might well be that these women uh, at fish concomitantly with taking these pills so that they actually received a higher dose. This is very speculative indeed. But that's my experience with female patients. They take advice much more seriously than men as regards lifestyle changes. But you know, Cecilia touched on another important issue. The anticipation 
anticipated number of events in his trial was supposed to be over 300, and in fact it was less than 200. So it could be that that's yet another important proviso when we interpret these data points, that overall the study ended up being underpowered. I, I think that's a very important point. And the point there is the study was done in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, people eat a lot of fish, herring, and so on. So even people who were placebo took a lot of fish. Had the study been done in the American Midwest, where the diet is steak, gravy, and potato in Even general. Worse. It, yeah. And uh, nobody has seen the fish in years. Then probably the study may have been not so negative. Cornelia, do you do you uh, prescribe the omega-3 unsaturated uh, fatty acids uh, to people? Yeah, we prescribe it in the first three months after acute myocardial infarction. Do you this do is you according to, have to you the Have you used it in other conditions, in other uh, settings? Arrhythmias or? Mm. Actually, no, we are just prescribing in according to the guidelines only after acute myocardial infarction, but otherwise, in terms of diet and lifestyle, we are always recommend people to eat uh, uh, three times fish per, per, per week, so, and especially oily fish. I don't have a problem with recommending that people eat fish and eat oily fish, but let's remember that what's in the guideline is on the basis of a trial where there was inadequate statin use. Yeah. You know, there was inadequate uh, secondary prevention use. And I am just a little bit cautious about saying that should be such a firm thing in the guidelines, in the American guidelines as they are. <laughs> what is interesting, the guidelines came from a single trial. From a single trial. And, uh, which has been always a question on guidelines. And there have been other trials that are negative. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, any other comment, uh, Clyde, about uh, this issue? Uh, what about cardiac failure? It has been used uh, in cardiac failure, actually in the Italian trial. In the Italian trial, there was a very modest, uh, modest signal of benefit with the omega-6 fatty acids, but virtually no clinical use of the same in clinical heart failure, at least in the U.S. So I don't know that that's, that that's been embraced. Cecilia, in atrial fibrillation, there are some people who are using. Uh, well, there was the Armida trial or yes. uh, that uh, actually showed that you did have a lower incidence of atrial fibrillation post-cabbage over a one-year follow-up, at least uh, um, as far as I remember. Uh, but I don't remember the dose of uh, the omega-3 fatty acids used in that trial. I think, though, it was 400 milligrams twice daily, but I'm not sure. So Harvey, New Zealand, Australia, you eat a lot of fish. Do you prescribe these supplements? I do in the first uh, year after infarction. And, and I do in people who advance coronary disease, uh, the LDL is down and the coronary arteries look like diabetic coronary arteries. So it's a bit of the no harm and may do some good approach, not based on evidence-based uh, trials. Yeah, Clyde? One of the things we're doing right now is that we're all taking a physician-centric view about how we prescribe, but there is a population-centric or patient-centric view here because this is available over the counter. And this is the kind of information that the lay community reads about and thinks on and acts upon. So it's very important that we have clear messages that for those that already have established heart disease, use of the evidence-based therapies that you're being prescribed really drive your outcomes. And spending a lot of time on a supplement and money on a supplement might be something to reconsider. Yep. And you know, especially in Europe, as we know across Europe, there are parts of Europe where the use of uh, non-evidence-based uh, alternative therapies is highly prevalent, yes. including up to about a quarter of the population. And you know, should people be spending their time and effort and money? You could say, well, it's doing no harm, but is it? Or at least, shouldn't we have more studies to demonstrate, to demonstrate it. what's going on? If you take a history of a patient, and I think you will agree with that, and the patient tells you that he's taking supplements, that patient, the high percentage, take 1,000 other vitamins. Mm -hmm. So there is a mindset up for supplements today in the world we live of consumption, which I don't know what the end result is, but I think this is a problem. In this case, uh, uh, what message we could give to the public? I mean, the message we could give maybe is the summary of this discussion, and that is, uh, let's go home and eat fish. 
<laughs> you know, that Let's may go not home be a and have a good message. balanced diet with lots of vegetables and fish and all the rest of it. And don't spend your money buying supplements. That's probably the message. You people take this into account. <laughs> this may be the most important comment made today. Uh, we haven't in this eaten it. <laughs> we haven't eaten it. Now, should we eat the buried uh, Scandinavian fish? Absolutely, salmon from the um, or sea. You know the, the 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 one the special one that you bury underground. Uh -huh. Aha! Well? well, I don't know, but I don't eat it. It's very salty. <laughs> it has other side effects. <laughs> <laughs> there is a uh, uh, talking about fish. Uh, you know, there is a lot of people in the environment. You know that are very concerned about the exhaustion. For example, tuna and other types. So we, 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 all should, uh, we all should think globally, I think, on every discussion, so either it's the cost, the environment, the consumption, and so forth. You had a comment to make, Cornelia. I had a comment to make about uh, these supplements and taking patients taking so much supplements. But it should be made clear that, that for example, omega-3 fatty acids in the supplements in a very low dose and you shouldn't expect uh, effect taking omega-3 fatty acids. Because you acids consider there is a low yeah. dose. Yeah. It's a good comment. The dose is certainly much lower than the dose in the other yeah. trials. Well, um, I would like just to finish by asking each of you of the three studies that we presented, what is the most striking aspect, either positive or negative? And I am, I am starting with you, Dr. Masselli. Well, I think the shift study is indeed impressive to me. You know, first of all, showing that heart rate, even in heart failure, is a major predictor of morbidity and mortality. And second, that manipulation of heart rate indeed can be b beneficial and that possibly there's a shift in paradigm away from the neurohumoral concept uh, in the treatment of heart failure. Cornelia? Well, uh, in terms of prevention, <laughs> I think uh, uh, it's more uh, very important trial this one about the, the omega-3 fatty acids for me, because uh, talk, uh, working in the prevention, we are always recommending eat fish and eat fish and eat fish and oily fish, and, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, I have many patients who go to the pharmacy and they buy supplements and they buy oily fish and they are very proud and they. Uh, I, I have supplements, I have, uh, I, uh, I take uh, oily fish and I don't need to eat fish really, and with it, which is not the case. So uh, I would recommend to have a much balanced diet uh, with fruits and vegetables and fish and uh, uh, less saturated fat and so on, but uh, not to rely on the supplements. There are some people who buy their packet of cigarettes along with the supplements. You know, let, let's focus here on some of the things that we know really work in terms of reducing events. And we've got to prevent events. We've got to treat hypertension well, yeah. you know. But, that, but I think I would agree entirely about the issue of the heart rate. For the first time, we've got something that is changing heart rate alone, and it's given us new insights. Good. Cecilia? Y yes, I agree on that concept too. Only ex excludes a large number of heart failure patients with True. atrial fibrillation, so it probably is more leans more towards the mild heart failure patients and the disease prevention. There's more to resolve. Yes, uh, but uh, that's certainly a landmark uh, event that we have a new drug in heart failure. And then I'm also impressed by uh, Pixiban uh, findings. Although uh, I would be more impressed if there was a comparison with warfarin. Yeah. Cecilia, can I ask you a question? It comes to mind the recent study on atrial fibrillation where a heart rate of 110, they did as well as a rate of 70. How do you interpret that? That is really tricky. That's a lenient rate control versus a strict rate control by Isabel van Gelder. And she clearly showed that you don't gain anything by uh, having a strict rate control. I really don't know what to make of that because we've been working so long and so hard uh, with the lowering okay, heart rate much more. I don't uh, want to distract <laughs> you <laughs> from you. Uh, no, but I mean, that doesn't go very well with the shift trial, no, no doubt, but it's not exactly the same patients. The only reason I'm mentioning this because pa it was part of the discussion uh, of a previous forum here, and there was a lot of discussion, if you remember. Anyway, thank you very much. Harvey? For me, it's a SIFT uh, trial. Uh, change in paradigm, change in practice, no side effects, cost effectiveness, decreasing hospitalizations. I think it's terrific. Excellent. Clyde? I'm going to take a very different view. 
and put on the hat that I use when we're writing guidelines and overseeing the construct of guidelines, and I know several of you participate in that process as well. We're very tempted to look at registry data, to look at observational data, to look at single arm data so we can get the information more quickly and bring it to bear for the clinical use in a more expeditious manner. Nothing trumps the randomized controlled clinical trial. If you put all three of these together, important observations, important data points to give us some confidence, some security that what we're writing, what we're talking about really has some veracity. So we can't retreat away from that important dictum. Nothing trumps the randomized controlled clinical trial. I'd rather have fewer trials that have meaningful statements than a lot of noise that's difficult to interpret. Yeah, thank you. Well, my comment, uh, my prerogative as chair, I have one comment. I'm in agreement with everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> I think all the comments were very pertinent, and I think uh, uh, each of you made a good summary of the discussion today. Thank you very much, and thank you all of you who have been watching these stars today. Thank you. <laughs>